All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our talk today. My name is Urvashi Monani, and I'm a principal software engineer on the OpenShift MCO team, but previously was on the containers team. So here today, I'm here to talk to you about a new feature in Podman. And I'm Sally. I'm also principal software engineer in emerging tech. Uh, so over the past year, I've worked with a lot of AI stuff, of course, um, Edge, and uh, all the while, always using containers. Um, so yeah. Yep, and today we're here to talk to you about how you can farm out your image builds. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to talk about what is multi-arch um, and also introduce the tools like Podman Farm Build and then um, talk about how they're used, you know, how I use them in, in the things I work on every day and, uh, and then uh, you can go on to the next talk probably. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, what is multi-arch? Well, different architectures, different CPU architectures, um, like x86, um, ARM, ARM, maybe S390, there's a whole bunch of them. They uh, have unique compilation processes, unique um, binary formats, uh, library dependencies, even different system calls, et cetera, et cetera. So most, pro most programs, if you build them on one architecture, are going to have a problem if you go and run them on another architecture. Um, it wasn't all that big of a deal until recently when you know, half of us started developing on our MacBook, our, you know, ARM MacBooks, and we're collaborating with, uh, you know, people running Linux. And uh, also, the stuff that's running in production is usually running in Linux, and here we are developing on MacBooks. Um, so tools like Podman, Builda, um, they uh, combine, images get combined into a manifest list. So what's a manifest list? It's a way of bundling different architecture images into something that feels like a single image. So it's, you can think of a manifest list like an index that references the actual images that are um, the, the things built for the different architectures. So you probably use manifest lists all the time. You may not realize it. Uh, anything you pull down from a registry it, that is probably a manifest list. And your whatever runtime you're using, whatever like runtime or container engine you're using, just knows that if you're on an ARM system, it's going to look at that manifest list and pull down the ARM version. Uh, same thing if you're on AMD. So that's the way it works. Now, why multi art? Well, developers they don't generally expect to um, know the low-level differences between hardware and architecture. Uh, so these tools that create multi-arch images um, abstract that away and so that developers can focus on building their applications and they're not um, worrying about you know, which architecture they're, they're building for. So um, yeah, I already mentioned this. You, you, you may have noticed that you may, you may have been using manifest list and not even knowing it. So yeah, that's it. Yep. So multi-arch images have always existed. Um, the thing that kind of really exploded its importance was when Max switched over to silicon architecture, as Sally mentioned. So now developers, you know, have dev environments that are more likely to be a different architecture than that of what they're running in production. Um, so like, you know, having an easy way of creating these multi-architecture images has become even more important now and kind of a necessity. Um, so given multi-architecture images already existed, we had solutions that helped us build for those. Um, so one of them was having multiple different build configurations for each architecture. Basically what this means is that you had different machines of these various architectures, you ran your builds on those machines, then pushed those images out separately to the registry. Then you went ahead and manually built that manifest list um, to put all of that together. So this is a lot of work, can be tedious, it's kind of confusing, and it's just like a lot to manage manually. Um, if you wanted to build multi uh, arc arch images uh, from one machine. Uh, the container tools, Podman Build and Docker, all support this by using the QME user static package under the hood. So when you specify which architecture you want to build for with the platform flag, it basically just emulates that architecture for you, runs the build. Um, but we all know here that emulation is very resource intensive. So because of that, we end up having slow builds. And they could be anywhere from two to five times slower than doing a build on like of that of the native architecture. So wouldn't it be great if we could actually 
my take the actual uh, architecture that we're building for and build on that architecture? Yes, it would be. Um, so yeah, so there came a need to see if we could, you know, do multi-arch from one laptop, but not like, you know, um, have issues with performance. So how could we optimize for that? And that's kind of where Podman Farm was born. Um, the idea here is that, you know, how you were manually managing multiple builds for the different architectures on different machines. Is there a way we can kind of automate this process and just do everything with one single command? Um, so Podman has a Unix socket that a client can connect to over SSH. Um, so the idea here was that why don't we have machines of different architecture available that are running this Podman socket? And you from your local machine can, can then connect to this socket and send your builds over there. Um, so basically, we were like, let's leverage that and let's do that. So when you're running Podman farm build, you specify the container file you want to build, you specify the name of the image, and what it does is that it takes all the build data, all the information that is needed, sends it over to these nodes in the farm. The nodes in the farm will build the image for you using Podman build. So exactly the same as you do it on your local machine. There's nothing different here. It still uses builder under the hood. It builds these images and then pushes them to a registry directly. Um, once we push the registry, we get the digest back, and then we create a manifest list um, from this information and push that manifest list as well to the registry. So all of this is automated. It's happening from one command. Um, there's no need for you to you know, log into different machines, to build the images separately uh, on your own, and then push it, and then create a manifest list. Um, so I mentioned farm here, but what a farm basically is is just a group of uh, machines. These can be virtual machines, physical machines. You can have EC2 instances. Basically, any machine that can run Podman for you um, and enable that socket. Um, so, yep, uh, the diagram here is three farms, but you can have as many or as little farms as you want. Your farms can have as many or as little nodes in it as you want. Um, the idea here is to have the nodes of different architectures. If you have the same architecture multiple times, Podman farm is not that smart. It just like picks the first one it finds and builds on that. Um, so, the idea here is to we use the native architecture and not emulate it. That, that's how you like not take a hit on performance. Um, so I said a lot here, but it's always fun to you know see a demo about how all of this works. So I have a demo of Pod Podman Farm working. I think that font is good. All right, so uh, in the terminal, when you have Podman installed and you do Podman Farm, so this is basically the help menu. Um, so you can create your farms, you can add nodes to your farms, you can remove nodes from your farms, um, you can do all of that. And most important one here is the build command, which is what will actually enable you to do the build for that multi-arch image. Um, so here I have, uh, I've listed the farms that I currently have. Um, I have three farms um, in my, on my system configured right now. So the first one has two nodes in it. Um, it's a Fedora 37 and a Fedora 38 ARM node. So my 37 is just a regular AMD machine, and Fedora 38 is an ARM architecture machine. Um, farm 2s and Farm 3 just has those nodes in it, but just one of them. So if I send it, I'll just build of that one architecture. And you can see here, default is set to true for um, Farm 2. So what that means is that if I don't specify which farm I want to send the build out to, it will default to Farm 2. Um, if you have no default, it basically, I think, looks at all the system connections and sends it out to the nodes available. Um, so to add a system connection, you use the Podman system connection subcommand. Sally actually shows that in her demo, which will happen after this. But basically, it's just pointing to the Podman socket um, running on your machine um, so that when we run it here, it can talk to that. All right, so I have a simple container file, um, just you know, runs the architecture and the date. Um, very simple. And the first command I'm going to do is, uh, oh, sorry, here, I'm just showing the help menu of the build, farm build. Basically, it has all the flags that you have available for Podman build. So just to highlight that there's nothing different happening here, we're just using Podman build as you're all used to. Um, so yeah, so the first command I do is um, I'm setting up my farm build. I want to push it to the F1 farm. So if you remember from earlier, the F1 farm has two nodes. Um, my F37 and F38 ARM. Uh, we have a flag called local. So when local is set to true, what, mean, what that means is that it will do a build on your local machine as well as all the nodes in the farm. So you're doing like one additional build. Um, it'll be the, of that same architecture as what your local machine is. But here I just want to build it on the farm. 
So I'm setting local to false. And um, if you can see here, I tagged it with a fully qualified image name. And that is because we need to specify the registry and namespace where we want to push this image to. Because as I mentioned, after the images are built, we push it directly to a registry. We do not pull it back to the local client. Um, this was the best way we came up with so that you're not just transferring files back and forth. Everything is on the registry. So when you want to then run this image, you just one man pull or one man run. It will detect the architecture you need and pull that down for you and run it. So we got a bunch of output when we run that. We see our builder is ready, our farm is ready. The output, um, you can see here that it detected the different architectures of the nodes um, in that farm. And the output is the same as you'll see with Podman build. You'll see the different stages and everything happening. Um, so once this is done, it gets directly pushed to the registry. That will be my account on Quay, because that's what I tagged it as. And um, once that is done, it creates a manifest list locally on my machine over here. And it also pushes that manifest list to Quay. So as you can see here, build was successful. We successfully pushed it to the registry, and we created that manifest list. Now when I do Podman images, I only see that manifest list that was created. And when I inspect that, we'll see that um, it'll have two indexes pointing to the two different architectures, the AMD64 and ARM64 matching exactly what the nodes were in that farm. Um, so this kind of gives you a full overview of how the farm build works. Um, this next example I'm doing is I'm not specifying the farm, so it's going to default to F2 which I think was an F38 ARM. And my local is set to true by default here. So when we see here, we see that it says, OK, local builder ready. That means I'm going to build on the local machine as well as on the nodes in the farm. Um, you can see here it detected that my local was an AMD64 machine, which it is. So I was able to detect that architecture as well. It ran the build. And one more thing I want to um, highlight here is you'll see using cache for the node that was um, in the farm, that's because we just ran a build over there. We didn't change anything in the container file, so it's just using the available cache. Uh, just again to highlight exactly as what Podman build does. You can obviously modify this with a no cache flag. Um, yeah. Yes, the credentials are taken from your local machine. Oh, sorry. The question was, are the credentials taken from your local machine? And the answer is yes, the credentials are taken from the local machine. We pass that on along um, through the connection. Oh, so now when we do Podman images, we have many more images here now. So when we build an image, we basically create an unnamed, untagged image. And since I built on my local machine this time, you see that in the list over here. When we push the image of the registry, it is still untagged, but it now has the name of the you know, manifest list that you had passed in, in your original command. So we see my image 2 is also built over here. And when we inspect that, it also has two indexes. AMD64, because that's what my local machine architecture is. And ARM64, because that was the one node that was in the farm. Um, so. Uh, I'm just going to quickly skip ahead here because I made some typos while recording, and we don't need to go through that. Uh, but yeah, so one more time, just listing the farm. I'm going to use farm 3 now, which is just an F37 node, which was AMD64. And there's this flag called cleanup. So when we pass this cleanup flag, what this means is that when your image is built on the registry and then successfully pushed to the, sorry, when it's built on the farm node and then successfully pushed to the registry, we delete that image. So you don't have any lingering images around, and you don't have to go manually and clean it up. So if your use case is, I just want to build it once, I don't need to rebuild again, I don't want it lying around, just pass this flag. And after your builds are done and push the registry, it will clean it up for you. You'll have nothing there. Um, so again, we'll inspect this my image 3. And we'll see that this one will only have one index because I only built on the farm node. I had said local to false, so it only has the AMD64 architecture, which is what that node was. Now this last part is I'm SSHing into that node that did my build. And when I do Podman images, you can see that there is no unnamed, untagged image there. That's because it was successfully cleaned up after the build was successful and it was pushed to the registry. Um, so yeah, so this is the demo in the terminal, and I just want to show you what the image looks like on Quay. So this was my image one. That was the first one that I built that had two indexes, uh, two architectures. 
So when you look at the child manifest, you see it has the AMD64 and ARM64 architecture. So when I just do a Podman um, run, you run E8 slash my image one, it'll detect the architecture I'm on and pull that image down for me. And then um, if we look at, sorry, if we look at my image three, which was only one node, so it only had one architecture, you can see it only has the AMD64. So it still created a manifest list for you, just it has one architecture image in it. Um, yep, that's kind of all I have, and now back to you, Sally. Yeah, so there are three, um, there are three areas where I think multi-arch, there are three areas where the multi-arch images are especially important. Uh, in my mind, the three things that I've been working on, AI, edge, and um, image-based operating systems. Uh, so for AI, you know, the past few decades, data scientists have been uh, experimenting and researching uh, AI. They've been living in their Jupyter notebooks and their Python virtual M's. And now, all of a sudden, with the explosion, we all have to figure out how to, how to deploy these things. And so the data scientists, that's not their expertise. So we've come together, and that's really what I've been working on the past years. And um, it comes down to containerization. Uh, how do we deploy all applications today? It's with Kubernetes. It, on the edge, it's with Docker, Podman, um, and various footprints, various devices, hardware, arch architecture. So um, these uh, programs need to run seamlessly across the entire infrastructure, and that's why multi-arch images are absolutely critical. Um, uh, uh, same, same idea with the edge, that hybrid landscape. Um, but the image-based operating system, there are many talks on this, and I hope you all get to catch, catch some talks, so I'm not going to really talk about it too much. But uh, with image-based operating systems, uh, from the kernel to your applications, you can now package and deliver an entire operating system as an OCI image, as a container image. Uh, so obviously, um, with things that you put in, in, in your operating system, like kernel drivers, toolkits, like the NVIDIA toolkit is one that comes to mind. These things are extremely um, uh, heavy and hardware specific. Uh, so uh, with image-based operating systems, the uh, multi-arch stuff really comes into play too. Uh, so I do have a demo also. I'm going to be pausing it. So my demo starts in the AWS console. Uh, you may dislike the AWS console as much as I do. Uh, but I, I spun up a couple of uh, EC2 instances, an AMD and an ARM. By the way, uh, as far as I know, there may be a subtle difference, but AMD64 equals x86-64. Uh, we can have a discussion about that. I see Matt. <laughs> Matt's going to school me later. But, but so, like, the AMD64 is basically, like, you know, synonymous with x86-64. And then the ARM is, is a different. So I have those two. Um, and I am going to go through and show you how to set up your Podman farm. So the first thing would be to uh, SSH into one of your, here we go, yep, SSH into the machine. And you have to install Podman. So this is a RHEL system. I'm installing Podman. Once you install Podman, you have to start the Podman, the Podman socket. Uh, so I recommend starting the Podman socket as a regular user. So you, that would be systemctl-user. Um, enable and start the Podman socket. Great. Guess what? That's it. That's all you need um, once that's, that's running. Uh, you can exit from the system, go back to your local host, and uh, start setting up your farm. So the first thing I do is create an empty farm, Podman farm create, I call it DevConf. There's nothing in it yet. Uh, next step is to go to your Podman system connections. So if you run on a Mac, you're running um, Podman desktop. The reality is if you're not running on Linux, you're always running containers in a virtual machine. Um, that's just the reality. Uh, so here I have a couple of Podman system connections already. I have my Podman machine one. And I've already added the um, ARM64 EC2 instance. So I, I want to I pause here and show you um, how to add a new system connection. Because, well, 
Uh, sorry, sorry, Podman folks, but the documentation isn't great. On, and, and so, thank you. Um, so here it is. You pass your identity file, and uh, you give it the path to the Podman SOC. And so now I have a new system connection, and um, I can simply add them to my empty Podman farm. So I update it with my two connections that I want, ARM64 and AMD64. And now we are ready to run Podman farm build. Um, this is basically the same that you just saw with Urvashi. I want to talk about this container image that I'm building. It's a model server. It's a Llama CPP Python model server. Uh, and it's, it's one that's very common if you're kind of an AI hobbyist or you know, it's what you usually run locally or to serve models. And it's big and it's hardware specific. And so I thought this would be a good example. So I'm going to run Pyman Farm build, and I, t and I timed it. Now, I sped it way up, so you don't really get the, the sense of the time of these. But um, I told you when it's done that it took two minutes. So here it is. It's, you, Urvashi showed you this a little bit slower. Um, it's going out to the EC2 instances, building, the, uh, building on them, and then um, uh, creating my manifest list and pushing it to the registry. Very convenient. Now, before Podman Farm build, hold on. Before Podman Farm build, how did you build multi-arch images? Probably like one of a couple ways. First way, before, when I realized, oh, crap, I'm, I'm running on a Mac. I need to share it with someone. I, I need to, to run. So I would do my Podman build. That would be on my arm. That would be arm. And I would just tag it my image arm. Kind of dumb, right? And then I wanted to share it with Urvashi, so I do a Podman build again, except I would pass the platform flag and um, tag it with AMD64. Um, I have two images up in Quay, one with arm tag, one with AMD64. Maybe you've all done that too. It's very manual, very much going to not scale well, not easy to track, keep track of. So the next way would be um, with a GitHub action. If you, I would highly recommend using the build a GitHub action because if you pass multiple app platforms to the build a GitHub action, you automatically get the manifest list. Um, in fact, like Podman Farm Build uses build a under, under the hood and you get the manifest list. It's just done for you. You probably don't even think about it much. It pushes it to the registry. Um, there you go. And the um, third way then would be Podman Farm Build. The first way is using emulation. Actually, Podman build an action using emulation too. <laughs> you were like, she's doing the wrong So let's see. Um, I'm, oh, wait, the third way. Sorry, hold on. The third way is to manually run Podman manifest create, which I'm going to do here, and Podman manifest, Podman build dash dash manifest. So you can manually create your um, manifest list. You need to be sort of a Podman super user or just like know a lot about Podman to even know this command exists. You need to know the right flags to pass to it. Um, so here, um, I was playing around building an S390X image and I thought I could go to AWS and like show it. No, you can't just go to AWS and spin up a S390X. So, so I took that out. Um, I did take that out. but. Uh, here, I am going to manually create a Podman manifest with the no farm. And if our hypothesis is correct, this should take a lot longer because when you pass the platform to Podman build, you are using emulation. Um, so no farm should be slower. And let's see. Indeed, it is very much slower. It was slower than I um, thought it would be. So again, with Podman farm build, the same exact image, same exact platforms, took two minutes. With Podman manifest create, Podman build dash dash manifest, the manual way, it takes a whopping 10 minutes. Uh, and that's crazy, right? That's five times slower than the farm build. So, and it's easier. 
So once you get used to it, once you get used to that adding the Podman system connection, um, Podman farm build is the way to go. Yeah, and the reason it's lower is because it is using emulation. And as you mentioned, emulation is resource intensive and just slow in general. <laughs> I already covered this slide, yes. right? Okay, cool, cool. Um, yep, that's so, uh, yeah, um, questions? Comments? Yep. Um, just before, oh, we, yeah. before quickly we do that, so Boyman Farm is still very fresh, very new. Um, we would all like you to use it and test it out. Let us know if there's any more features you would like to see, any more optimizations. Um, in the future, we want to add this to Podman Desktop as well, so you can do similar things with a bunch of button clicks and use Podman machines as, you know, your virtual machines of different architectures. Um, but yeah, so that's coming soon. We have links to the recordings here and the docs, and a blog should have happened. I've just been procrastinating on it, so working on getting that out soon also on this feature. Uh, but yeah, that's all we have for you today. Thank you. So we do have a few minutes, like questions, comments. Has anyone used Podman Farm? Has anyone used Build Multi-Arch Images, Maya? So I'm going to try to answer that, and then she'll tell me if I'm right. Repeat the question. Oh, yes. So why do you have to create the manifest locally and then Podman Farm instead of creating the manifest on the uh, remote systems. Yes. Uh, so uh, the way I understand it is that the Padma, when you say Padma manifest create, it's kind of an empty thing. It's like a scaffold. You know, it's, 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 it's like a box ready to receive some images in there. So um, that is kept locally. And then there's no reason to, to send it to the remote machines. You keep that locally. And then you take those remote images and just add it to the manifest. They can be in different locations. And then you just push everything up. So I guess it's just efficiency. Yeah. And also, like, the nodes in the farm do not talk to each other. They don't really know about each other. So you need, like, one common area where we can build that list for you. The nodes are able to push it. And then the, the local uh, client is able to get the digest back. So because there's that, like, one common place, that's where we build it. Plus, it gives you that same feel of building your images locally because when you do a Podman build, you see the images when you do Podman images. Now, if we don't build the manifest list on the local side, then you won't see anything there. And the user will be like, what happened? Where did my images go? So it's to also give that. Um. Yes? Does it mean that the, the image is built on a farm, but uh, it's uh, sent back to the uh, node? Uh, so the question is, does it mean that um, the node, like the, the image built on the node is sent back to the local client instead of directly to the registry? That's your question, right? Um, no. So when the image is built on the node, we send that images directly to the registry. It's just the manifest list part. You can think of a manifest list as like a JSON file that puts together the indexes of the images that are in a registry somewhere. So we get information of the digest of that image, and we just create that list. But the images are directly pushed to the registry. We don't pull anything back to the local client. So another benefit of, of using Podman Farm Build is your local system, those resources aren't being taken, you know, the, the build, the resources that takes the build. So that's a, that's a, that we didn't mention. That's another benefit. Anything else? Yes. Are there any integrations that make setting up Podman Farm easier? As of now, no. As of now, no. no. But um, we but are, yeah, sorry, we're, we're welcoming issues and requests, yeah. <laughs> and I would say that, well, okay, so setting up the system connection is, is a pain. But uh, also just setting up the Podman manifest create manually and adding that, and those, those are also pains. So it, it kind of made it a, a little bit better, different pain. But once you set up your farm nodes and everything, then you don't have to do it again. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, let's assume that we have a farm. And then one node is up. Do you have kind of like a pooling mechanism? Or you just want to see one node because of the need to then build in another one? Or you can just like kind of like come up with the old uh, building or OK. 
So the question is, um, let's say you have a farm and you have one node that is unavailable. Do you have the ability to like pull that and figure out what's going on basically, right? Um, so the answers are like, not really. The farm is not super smart right now. So we do pull the nodes before we start the build. So if you saw, you, you would see logs of builder X ready, builder X ready. So we check to see that we're able to connect to those nodes. That means the Podman socket is running on those nodes. Now, if, it is, if that doesn't work, I believe the whole thing fails right now, if one, even one node is down. So that is something that we need to make smarter, that we don't need to fail the whole thing, just that architecture is not going to build, basically. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, that, that's a great idea and question. And, uh, repeat the question. Oh, geez. Can you repeat it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I believe the question is, um, is there, because you don't always need to be doing the builds, right? Is there a way for the nodes like, to be going on and off and you still being able to build the multi-arch images on it? Um, I believe the Podman socket does go off and you can connect to it and start it again, right, Matt? Like, Okay, so if it's like a virtual machine or AWS node, we cannot take down the whole node, but Podman itself. Yeah. So it sounds like maybe an integration with yeah. like Terraform or something could, could automate that. Yeah. Yeah, since I finally set up my farm uh, for this talk, I now have those couple of EC2 instances, and I'm just, I stopped it when I was done. So yeah, I manually just start and stop it when I need it, but they're always there. And, Yes. Ah, great question. So is there any support for signed images? That's more of a, or image signing. It's more of a general Podman um, question. And yes, Podman has support for um, image signing, GPG. Um, Miloslav is the person to really ask that question. But it's not, it's not totally integrated with, um, Podman farm build, but uh, can you pass it? Oh, if you this can is pass it with Podman build, then yes, I haven't tried it personally. But if it's a, one of the flag options that we have available, then it should work. If it doesn't, please open an issue. <laughs> yeah, so we could pull up the menu, and yeah. there's probably a flag for signing. We, I haven't tried it, but do you want to? Oh, sign the manifest list. Can we sign manifest list or no? Or do you sign the individuals? Uh, okay. So it's probably not integrated to Podman Farm yet. Yeah. Uh, we didn't mention the future. So before we, we head out, so a few things is integrating Podman Farm with Podman Desktop. If any of you are Mac users, I see some apples up there. Um, that is something that's coming up next. Uh, if you all, if anyone wants to help with that. Um, and yeah, and just oh. adding more features, like as you mentioned, the signing thing, we just yep. didn't think about that. Yeah. And what goes, what goes with adding this to Podman Desktop is the ability to have Podman machine, have multiple Podman machines running at the same time. I don't think that's possible now, but I think you all are talking about it. And with Mac, uh, I think with Rosetta, it's easier to build a, like a different architecture VM running yes. on your MOS, so that will. Oh, slow. Well, we don't want slow. We want the real hardware. So forget that. Uh, thank there's you so much. There's one last question. One last question. How do you test on different architectures? So you notice we, we run on AMD and ARM64. Uh, I tried to build an S390X, and it took like a half an hour to build uh, in emulation. It does it. Uh, but I, yeah, it's just do you, if you have access to hardware, you can, and it can run Podman and start the Podman socket. That's all you need. So. All right. Thank you. I think we're out. Thank Bye. you.